It's always great when God's people come together. It's always a time of special gathering, but Easter just kind of brings it up a notch and it reminds us of the victory of Jesus Christ over death and hell and the grave. And because he's victorious, we are victorious as well. And so happy Resurrection Sunday. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most significant event that has happened in time as we know it. In fact, so significant was that event that every time we write down the date and we put AD or BC, we're reminded of how the resurrection of Jesus Christ changed the course of even our calendars. The resurrection of Jesus Christ became the turning point for all of humanity. And it became the the turning point even for his disciples who walked with him. The events of the previous Friday for the disciples of Jesus, the, namely the crucifixion of Jesus, left the disciples speechless. They were scattered. They were confused. They were broken. This one in whom they put all of their hope in, this one in whom they left everything to come and follow after, hang dead on a cross. Luke records that a man named Joseph from Arimathea, a man who was seeking the kingdom of God, found the kingdom of God in Jesus, but he asks for the body of the Lord once he had come down from the cross. And Joseph takes the body, he wraps the body of Jesus in a linen cloth and places the lifeless body of Jesus into a borrowed tomb. I like that. Jesus did not need a long-term lease or ownership of that tomb because he wasn't planning on staying very long. And so he's placed in a borrowed tomb. All four of the gospels account for the resurrection narrative, but we're gonna take a look at that this morning through Matthew's gospel. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me. Matthew chapter 28 in verse one. Now after the Sabbath, Toward the dawn of the first day of the week, it's Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. I love that. Could you imagine what that must have been like? This earthquake takes place. An angel from the throne comes down, rolls the stone aside, and sits on what was this this door that blocked entrance into the tomb. He rolls it aside. Historians tell us that this, this stone was so large, it was no less than two tons. It was an enormous stone that he sat upon. And he rolls the stone aside. Why roll the stone aside? Not so Jesus can get out, but so Mary and Martha could walk in and see that he has risen. This angel, it says, his appearance was like lightning, his clothing white as snow, and for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. I mean, could you imagine what that must have been like for these soldiers that were commissioned to guard the tomb of Jesus? There was fear by the Romans and the Jews that, that somebody would steal the body of Jesus and substantiate his resurrection, and so they posted no less than 16 of Rome's finest soldiers around the tomb, these men who were trained not to sleep at all, 
and they see this event, they sense the earthquake, this angel comes and he says, obviously they are scared out of their minds. And the guards trembled and they passed out. So it says, they became like dead men. <laughs> Could you imagine this from, from Mary and Martha's perspective, watching what's going on here? And but the angel said to the women, don't be afraid. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Don't be afraid, for I know that you see Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, he says, I, I have told you. What an incredible scene that we stumbled across here in Matthew chapter 28. And so the ladies head back to Galilee. And in John's gospel, we read that Jesus, as his disciples were gathered together in a room, Jesus walks through the wall and presents himself to his disciples. And he says, peace be with you. And then proceeds to show him, show them his hands and his side that was pierced just days earlier. A regathering of these friends, these disciples. All of the disciples are there that day except for Thomas. We don't know where Thomas was, but, but for some reason, he wasn't with the rest of the disciples. I don't think it's a stretch to conclude that Thomas was just devastated over the events that took place that weekend. Perhaps having seen the Lord whom he loved, perhaps seeing even his, whole, his own dreams crumble before him, perhaps every hope that he had on this Jesus was crushed, that maybe Thomas just needed to kind of pull back a little bit. He needed to kind of process what was going on. We don't know why Thomas wasn't there, but we know at this occasion, when Jesus showed up to the, to the disciples, Thomas was not there. But something happens in the life of Thomas that I think is very interesting. Following this event, we see eight days later, Jesus shows up again. Verse 26 of chapter 20 in John's gospel says, and eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and John includes, and Thomas was with them. We don't know how Thomas went there. I'd like to think that somebody went after Thomas. Somebody reached out to that brother who was hurting, who was devastated, who was broken, who was disconnected, and said, man, you've got to come. The Lord showed up. We don't know all that went on, but we know this. Somebody brought Thomas, and Thomas was there. <laughs> this John says, and although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Don't you love Jesus just walking through walls, just appearing, out of, and you gotta remember, these are their friends. I don't know, if, I, mean, I kind of think Jesus probably had a, a sense of humor as well. I'm sure his disciples were there and they knew the doors were locked and nobody can get in and nobody can get out. All of a sudden, Jesus is like, oh, hey, where did you, where did you come from? Jesus stood amongst them. And he said, peace be with you. And I love what happens here. Jesus turns his attention right to Thomas. And he said, Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And I love this. Thomas doesn't need to touch the hands of Jesus. He does not need to thrust his hand into the side of Jesus. Just seeing the Lord before him, he falls and says, my Lord and my God. 
And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet they believe. I love that I serve a God who knows how to meet people where they're at. We don't know all that was going on inside the heart and mind of Thomas, but I thank God that Jesus knows how to meet us right where we're at. And that's exactly what Jesus does with Thomas. You see, the first thing that came to the mind of Thomas regarding the resurrection was doubt. And that same doubt has been the focus of, of many over the centuries. In fact, that doubt has evolved into many attempts to disprove the resurrection of Jesus. Because if you can disprove the resurrection of Jesus, then you can disprove all of Christianity. Good luck with that. Many have tried, everyone has failed. You see, there is so much documented evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that only a defiant commitment to ignorance can silence the vast amount of testimony that substantiates the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Far too much for us to list in our time together today, but I would encourage you to just search and read about the, the, the evidences of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You'll find yourself overwhelmed and encouraged to learn that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not some myth that, arrived, that, that they came to uh, around a table one day. It is not some fairy tale that was uh, in some book somewhere. It does not require blind faith or naivete. The evidence is substantial. It is logical. It is reasonable. It is credible. And it is conclusive. You do not need to check your brains at the door when trying to substantiate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The facts are overwhelming. It is this singular event the resurrection of Jesus Christ that substantiated the ministry of Jesus. It substantiated the teachings of Jesus. And it's, it, it substantiated the purpose for why Christ came to the earth. For Christians, it is the benchmark, the cornerstone, the foundation, the linchpin of our faith, dismantle the resurrection of Jesus and all of Christianity folds like a house of cards. No wonder there has been so much attempt over the centuries to disprove the resurrection. Many have set their lives to discrediting the resurrection only to bow the knee and confess Jesus Christ is Lord, risen and alive indeed. When you stack up all of the facts surrounding the resurrection of Jesus, the verdict is overwhelmingly clear. He that was dead is alive again. You don't celebrate an event 2,000 years later if that event couldn't have been substantiated. But here we are, the church of Jesus Christ, thriving in the world today, committed in the world today, willing to give their life for the testimony of Jesus. Why? Because he that was dead is alive again. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ, those who have died, they have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we of all people are most pitiful. But in Christ, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For as by a man, Adam, by a man came death. And so also by another man has come the resurrection of the dead. 
For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. I love what the Apostle Paul says here. He goes for as far, so far as to say that if Christ has not been raised from the dead, your Christianity is useless. You have been hoodwinked. You have been, uh, you have, you've been lied to. You're wasting your time. If Christ has not risen from the dead, you are still in your sins. You're still separated from God. You're still under the wrath of God. You're still in the worst situation possible. Those are the only two options. If Christ has not risen from the dead, we are dead in our trespasses and, sin, and sins, forever eternally separated from God. But if Christ has risen from the dead, all of our hope is in that monumental moment where Christ raised, was raised from the dead. And likewise, we, because of his resurrection, will be raised from the dead as well. You see, apart from Jesus, death is our destination. That's what man has waiting for him. Every man born of Adam is born a sinner. Paul writes, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's every single one of us. We are sinners we sin because we're sinners. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says that the wages of sin, the price, the penalty, the cost of sin is death. You can't get it any clearer than that. The wages of sin is death, but it doesn't stop there. There's good news. You see, the bad news is we've all sinned with the wages of sin is death. It's as bad as can be, but there's good news. That's what the gospel means. It means good news. And the good news of the gospel is that the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him would not perish, but have everlasting life. God stepped into our worst situation and became our only solution. And he substantiated that work on the cross by rising from the dead. But apart from Jesus, death is our destination. Apart from Jesus, death is our normal. Death is our normal. I don't know about you, but I'm getting tired of hearing people constantly preface everything with the words, when everything gets back to normal, I will fill in the blank, right? When everything gets back to normal, I will go to such and such a place. When everything gets back to normal, I will visit so and so. When everything gets back to normal, I will whatever we may want to do, right? When everything gets back to normal, life is going to happen apparently for us in some magical, mystical way. I don't know who everyone is waiting to tell us when things are normal again. I don't know what calendar, what agency, what politician, what doctor, or what unicorn everyone is waiting for to open up the gates and tell us things are back to normal. Proceed as usual. In fact, I don't ever recall a time in my life where I kind of looked around me and thought, this is pretty normal. <laughs> Has it ever been normal? So I figured in light of the fact that everything and everyone is waiting for the new normal to begin, I'd bring you some good news this morning and tell you this, that your new normal starts now. Your new normal starts now. We're gonna spend the next five weeks talking about some practical ways that we could capture and put in motion some of the positive things that we've learned over the past year. Things that we waited for to happen so that we could put in motion when things become 
normal again. I know everybody's been touched differently by this pandemic in this last year, and I have no desire to minimize the realities. Everybody's got different experiences and and different situations, and, and I have no desire whatsoever to minimize that, but I've discovered a couple of things. I've discovered that there's some things that aren't dependent upon the absence of a virus. There are some things that aren't dependent upon the enactment of guidelines, the wearing of a mask or social distancing. Not saying you shouldn't do these things. I'm just saying it's time to stop putting the life that God has for you on hold, waiting for normal to present yourself and enjoy the life that God has given you. I'm not saying ignore those things. Please understand. What I'm saying is let's stop putting life on hold. Let's stop waiting for changes on the outside to determine when changes on the inside start taking place. Your new normal starts now. And it begins on Easter Sunday. The day we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, what was normal for me outside of Jesus was I was dead in my trespasses and sins. What was normal for me was that I lacked peace. I lacked purpose. I lacked wholeness. I lacked these things because I was designed to be in a relationship with my designer, with my creator. But uh, the problem was I was born in sin. And so I was born disconnected from God. And I spent a lot of years trying to find fulfillment, trying to put a a round circle in in, 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 in a square hole of my heart and realize it just didn't fit. And so what was normal for me was the lack of the life that God had for me. I was hopeless and lost and and heading into an eternity without God. And so lost was normal. Hopelessness was normal. Without purpose was normal. Unfulfilled was normal. Disconnected was normal. Death because of Adam was normal. But Jesus came in. Jesus lived. Jesus loved. Jesus went to the cross for me. Jesus died for my sin. Jesus was placed in the tomb. And Jesus rose from the dead for you and for me so that my normal can be put away and my new normal starts now. Death has been defeated by Jesus. And so as I consider Resurrection Sunday and I consider my new normal starts today, the first title in this series that I want to bring to you is this. Death, you can't touch me. Death, you can't touch me. The resurrection of Jesus Christ cancels the grip that death had on you. Your normal was death, but Christ Christ rose from the dead. Your new normal is life. Jesus said the devil comes to kill and steal and destroy That was your normal. But Jesus said, I have a new normal for you. I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. That's the life that God has for you. Death, you can't touch me. And can I tell you the death that I'm referring to? Does it only refer to the cessation of life and eternal life that awaits for me? It it affects my every day right now. The devil comes to kill and steal and destroy right here on this earth. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly right here on this earth. Paul said, I has not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the heart of man the things that that God has in store for those who love him. That's not talking about heaven. It's talking about right here, right now, the things that the grip of death has kept us from. But the new normal starts now. 
Listen, Lazarus experienced the new normal when Jesus showed up. In John chapter 11, we read about the account of what happened with Lazarus. Lazarus had two sisters, Mary and Martha, and they were friends with Jesus. The three of them, they knew. They were in that, the inner circle of Jesus. And one day, Lazarus became sick. And so they said, let's reach out to Jesus. Let's reach out to our friend. Let's reach out to the healer. Let's reach out to the one that everywhere Jesus shows up, people walk away healed. And you know what? He's our friend. Surely he'll come on out. Reach out to Jesus so that he can fix our situation. And they reach out to Jesus and say, hey, listen, he whom you love is sick fully expecting Jesus to stop everything he's doing and come and heal Lazarus because that's what friends do, right? A friend stops what he's doing to meet a need. Surely Jesus, when he does that with strangers, surely he would do that with Lazarus. But Jesus didn't do that. In fact, Jesus did just the opposite. Instead of dropping everything he was doing, Jesus waited one day, two days, three days. And in the course of time that Jesus waited, the scriptures tell us that Lazarus died. Waiting for his friend Jesus to come heal him. Waiting for his friend that healed everybody else to come and heal him. Now, most of you are familiar with the story. You know that Jesus arrives on the scene. He steps up to the tomb. He sees the, the grieving of the family and the friends of Lazarus. And we see the shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five. 35, it says, Jesus, Jesus wept. We see the humanity of our Lord. And Jesus steps up to the tomb and calls out, Lazarus, come forth. It might have been the longest pause ever. You might have heard a gasp in the crowd. But walking through that blackened tomb, Lazarus comes walking out. Actually, he's probably hopping out. His feet are tied, his hands are tied, his, his face is covered. That's how they did that with those who died. That's how they buried them. But he comes walking out and Jesus says, loose him and let him go. What an amazing event that has taken place. This one whom Jesus loved this one who had tasted death for three days came out alive. I'm sure the people were shocked to have seen. Now, now that I've told you the end of the story, I just want to circle back for a moment. And let's kind of go back to the beginning a little bit. Let's listen in on to the conversation that takes place between Jesus and Martha. Because before the miracle, there's a little bit of drama that takes place. Every miracle needs a little drama, right? And so we see this, this, this conversation taking place between Martha and Jesus, John eleven twenty one. 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, let's just stop there, right? Lord, if you had been here, it's another way of saying, you let us down. We waited for you. We thought you were going to come. We're disappointed. That's what's in those words right there. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus, all of this is your fault. You could have prevented this. All the tears, all the hurting, all the grieving, it all have, could have been prevented if you had been here. 
But look at verse 22. But even now I know. Whatever you ask from God, God will give it to you. I like that. This is, this is Martha giving Jesus a second chance. <laughs> she sets the stage. You let us down. You disappointed us. We expected more of you. But I'm going to give you another chance right now. Because I know this. That if you ask your father, whatever you ask from God, he'll give it to you. And Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. We're all going to rise again, Jesus. We get that in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to him, no, no, no. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this, Martha? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, who is coming into the world. Perhaps she couldn't wrap her arms fully around what Jesus was saying to her, but she said, I don't know what you're going to do, but I know who you are. I believe you are the Christ, the son of God, who's coming into the world. You see, Jesus in that scene verbalizes the power that he has over death. The power that he has to break the death hold over somebody's life. She says, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 you got it all wrong, Martha. You see, the resurrection is not an event. The resurrection is a person. I am the resurrection in the life. He that believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. Don't wait for an event. The person has arrived and I've got power over death. And then Jesus backed up that claim when he rose from the dead, having defeated death himself. We wouldn't be talking about this 2,000 plus years later if this could have ever been disproven. Look what Paul says. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 55, 4 and 5. When the perishable puts on the imperishable. Who's that? That's us. Have you noticed that we're perishing? You feel it every morning? I'm feeling it more and more these days. When the perishable puts on the imperishable. There's a day that's going to come. We're going to have a little kick back in our step. You young ones don't know what I'm talking about. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? You see what Paul is writing here is basically, death, you can't touch me. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we no longer are under the grip and the power of death. And we're going to look it in the eye one day and say, oh, death, where is your victory? victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? That's the crazy thing about Christianity. The whole world is doing everything they can to avoid death. And for us, it's something we're looking forward to. I can't wait to see him face to face. I'm not in a hurry to get there. Don't get me wrong. But you know what? I've got a work to do. God's got things for me to do. But I'm looking forward to that day where I'll cross out of time and into eternity and I will see him who knew me and loved me and died for me and rose for me and gave me life. Death isn't something to avoid. Death is something for us to look forward to. Makes no sense outside of Christianity. Man's biggest fear is Christianity's greatest hope. Death, you can't touch me. Listen, your new normal is now life because of the resurrection of Jesus. Death can no longer touch you. You will never die because of the resurrection of Jesus. You will never die. You will simply cross out of this arena that we are all familiar with called time and you will step into eternity and forever be with your Lord. 
And that life starts the moment you embrace Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Listen, life doesn't begin in eternity. Life begins at the cross when we recognize that Jesus is my only means for salvation. When he rose from the dead, he substantiated his work on the cross. Jesus said that I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. You don't need to wait for things to go back to normal for you to walk in the life that God has for you, a life of peace, a life of love and joy and blessing, a life that is full of purpose and significance. You don't need to wait for the green light. Your new normal starts now. You can enjoy the fellowship you have with God now. I know for some that this season has been really hard. It's been really emotional. It's been really scary. It's been full of a lot of grieving, a lot of hurt and loss on so many levels. And I, and I would dare not even try to, to minimize what so many have walked through. And I think sometimes for some, the change of life so quickly has caused many to kind of take a step back. Kind of like Thomas, who walked with Jesus, who had things going all right, all of a sudden his world was turned upside down and he just needed a process. And I think there's been a number of people who, who they just kind of, the, life has just changed so much and we become so aware of how little in control we are of things. And that need for processing, that need of, of, of just trying to figure it all out for some, it's caused a, a, a pulling back even from just their walk with God, their time alone with the Lord and, and, and you know, reading their word and, and being in prayer and being in fellowship with one another, whatever it may be. But there's, there's, there's a number of people, nobody here, of course, I, I get it, not, not here, right? But, but I've heard there's some people out there like that who their spiritual journey has taken a hit because of the sudden change that was introduced into our environment. And they've kind of pulled back like Thomas. And perhaps they've comforted themselves with the fact that when things get back to normal, I'll re-engage in my walk with God. When things get back to normal, I'll start getting into the word more. I'll start fellowshipping more. I'll start standing up for Jesus more. When things get back to normal, listen, your new normal starts now. And just like Jesus met Thomas right where he's at, the good news is that Jesus knows where you're at. And he's not there to point a finger of judgment towards you. His arms are open wide. And he says, come, I get you. I know your frame. You don't have to struggle so much. Trust me. I want to encourage you this Resurrection Sunday morning that your new normal starts now. It's not about where you've been. It's about where you're going. Hey, listen, there's no grace in the past. So don't live there. It's not about where you were, it's about where you're going and who you'll trust to get there. You can trust Jesus. He knows you. He understands you. He loves you. He rose from the dead for you so that you may have a life the way he designed for you to live it. Paul says, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too should walk in newness of life. Life is our new normal. The enemy comes to kill and steal and destroy. 
Jesus said, I've got life for you. Life of abundance. And it's all because of the resurrection of Jesus that I can look death in the eye and say, death, you can't touch me. Journey with us these next five weeks as we consider what it looks like to embrace your new normal now. To stop waiting for changes on the outside. To determine when changes on the inside will take place. We've learned some things. We need to put them in motion. One of the things I've learned is to slow down. Sometimes when you're forced to slow down, it helps you learn it a little quicker. So next week's, next week's message is this. Pace, you're not the boss of me. Because my new normal starts now. Father, thank you for your goodness, for your love. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for rising from the dead for us. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never asked Christ to come into your life and to be your Lord and your Savior. Your new normal can really start right now. In the quietness of your own heart, I just encourage you to talk to Jesus. Forget where you are for a moment and just recognize there's a God in heaven who loves you, who knows you, has a plan and purpose for your life. Maybe you're watching online or on TV or some other venue. And these words pricked your heart and you just feel disconnected from God. And you've even said to yourself, when things get back to normal, I'm gonna go and get closer to God. Your new normal can start right now, wherever you are, just by opening your heart and saying, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. And your new normal starts right now. And you can stare death in the face in the face and say, death, you can't touch me because Jesus is Lord of my life. Amen.